Well, good morning. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. It is indeed a privilege uh, to be here with you today. I am probably the only non-economist in the room here. Uh, I identify myself as a demographer, and I define demography as the mathematics of people. People in, in Greek, the demos, the population, the, the changing size and composition of the population, but this also includes studies, uh, quantitative models of, of behavior. So uh, if you have an inclusive definition of economics, what I'm going to talk to you about is, is, well, may fall under economics. In terms of methods, what we demographers do, it's really uh, partly based on, on biology. In a way, we are just another animal species. So it's uh, biomathematics, biostatistics are the foundations of most of our methodology. But then, of course, we are very specific species that we, we do have conscious behavior, and that's why we need uh, psychology, sociology, and of course also economics in understanding uh, our behavior and, and our change, the distribution and size of our species on this planet. So by intention, I have a very broad focus here to give you a survey, not just about what demography can tell us about the future challenges, uh, but about an exciting new way of sort of, I would call it a crossover between demography and economics in terms of using demographic models uh, for, for modeling and, and projecting uh, human capital formation. Uh, as was said, indeed, uh, this famous uh, Austrian television dog Rex, uh, some of these episodes were filmed in our house. But I also uh, associate recently with this, uh, another famous Austrian philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein, it was said, and we were long thinking like, this institute now merges efforts of three institutes I'm affiliated with, the IASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, in a nice Habsburg castle outside Vienna, then the Vienna Institute of Demography of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, and the BU Vienna University of Economics. And we just recently discovered this logo, which is a, a sort of a head uh, of, a, of a young person, probably a young woman, and who has the, the, the world in the head, in the mind, and you will see female education really turns out to be one of the key variables uh, that we have identified as uh, being very influential in, in many efforts to reach uh, sustainable development on our planet. So let's start with the very big picture, sort of how many of us have there been. This is the total size of the world population from the year 2000 uh, to uh, 2100. So you see that throughout human history, we are well below one uh, that's 500 million people, roughly. There were ups and downs due to diseases and wars, and of course the history was different in Europe and in China and other parts of the world. But the important thing is that it was only in the uh, beginning of the 19th century uh, that uh, population growth started to take off, and this was primarily due to the fall in the death rates, due to better nutrition situation, some preventive medicine, public hygiene like sewage system, and so they helped to reduce the death rate. And with the birth rate still being high, uh, this was population growth first starting in Europe, and then in particularly after World War II, uh, this modern medicine, also the antibiotics, were brought to the developing world, and overnight there was a precipitous decline in death rates, together with still very high birth rates, and that caused what is often called the world population explosion that we saw during the 20th century. So over the 20th century, the world population grew from 1.6 billion in 1900 to 6.1 billion in 2000. And here, these different colors uh, are just different fractiles of an uncertainty distribution of the future, and we'll go into more detail later. Let's just uh, summarize. In a way, population forecasting is easier than economic forecasting, because we have fundamentally only three factors that can change the human population but each of them is, is difficult enough. So it's the, the birth rates or fertility as, as the birth intensity. Then it's the death rates, which is often measured through life expectancy. It's a summary measure derived from the life table, uh, capturing the mortality. So if we look at the planet, it's really only the fertility and mortality. But if we look at national populations or subpopulations, then of course we also have to consider the migration, people moving from one population to another. And for forecasting, we also need a starting population. We need to know how currently, what is the distribution of the population by age and sex for each region. It is important to know that the future path of all these three factors are, of course, uncertain. 
They are uncertain within ranges, uh, but there's no deterministic future. And therefore, we have to be extremely careful whenever you see a population projection, which usually just gives one line, the UN medium variant, or whatever, uh, ESTAT, or other statistical agencies just giving one line. Always be careful. There is significant uncertainty around these. And this is the uncertainty as we, we developed at YASA over the last uh, 15 years, uh, stochastic uh, population projection tools where we do capture the uncertainty in all of these three factors, fertility, mortality, and migration. And what we try to show there that the future is not entirely open. There is something we can say about it uh, because there's a lot of inertia. There are very few other social sciences where you can make projections for many decades into the future. In demography, we can because people who are 20 years old today, and we already know a lot about them, uh, they will be uh, 60 years old in, in 40 years' time. So we, we know how big these cohorts are, and there's a lot of stability in the system. So what we've done here is sort of plotting the results of uh, thousands of simulations, drawing randomly uh, from predefined uh, definitions of fertility, mortality, and migration. And here you see the resulting distribution with the media and the red line, and this is the 95% interval. Uh, first, what you see here that uh, you may have read in the newspapers that later this year we are kind of reached a 7 billion mark. Uh, well, there is also uncertainty around this. So we really don't know in many African countries, not even in China, how many people there are. There was a recent census, but there are uh, reasons to assume that the census is an undercount. So we believe uh, that um, we soon going to cross the 7 billion mark, but it's likely not being this fall, as has been announced, but maybe over the next two years. So uncertainty starts here, but there's little uncertainty. And of course, the further we go into the future, the more uncertainty there will be. What you see here, these are uh, projections that have gone through a lot of uh, refereeing and uh, input from international demographers. And we've actually published them now three times, new assessment each in the journal Nature, which is interesting. Unlike Science Magazine, which does have a social science editor, Nature doesn't have a social science editor, so we, you have to go through the biology editor, which again shows that we are just another animal, and this is our future number on this planet. Um, so what we see here is that with a rather high probability during the second half of the century, we will be reaching a peak and then having a decline. This was the 2001 Nature paper was entitled The End of World Population Growth, which many people misunderstood as saying that we already now have reached the end of growth, which of course is not the case. The paper says that with a high probability of more than 80%, we're likely to see an end of growth before the end of the century, then followed by some decline. But the picture is also confusing because it's so different in different parts of the world. This you see Eastern Europe, and Eastern Europe is with near certainty a pre-programmed decline in the population. Um, let me just take one country that I recently visited and advised the Prime Minister's Bulgaria, nine million people in 1990, when the big uh, change in system took place. And now all three factors worked against population growth. Lots of people leaving the country, fertility rates being extremely low, and mortality rates, unfortunately, also pretty high. So now today, the population has declined from 9 million to 7.4 million. And our projections, together with the Eurostat projections, also go to 6 million in 2030. So just over a few decades, a decline from 9 to 6 million. And for this reason, other presidents, uh, let's say the president of Ukraine, president of Belarus, and even Putin in Russia has said this population decline is a national security crisis. So it really gains some prominence in terms of decline. The same kind of crisis we see about the continuing population explosion in Africa. In many African countries, fertility rates are still five, six, or seven children per woman on average. And uh, you see here the African population, uh, this is sub-Saharan Africa, is roughly about uh, yeah, three quarters of a billion. All of Africa, including North Africa, is roughly a billion. And with very high probability a doubling, possibly even a tripling, in the worst cases, even a quadrupling of the population. And this is very rapid growth that uh, continues to be the same reason for concern as it has been in the 1960s and 70s when uh, this uh, fast increase started. Again, what is the reason in Africa for this rapid growth? Death rates used to be very high, like almost half of the children used to die before they reached uh, puberty in uh, Africa. Now, Western medicine has come and reduced child mortality, which is, of course, a great thing. Everybody's happy about this. And 
fertility rates, how many children you want, is much more embedded in the social norms. And that means that fertility aspirations remained high. Ideal family size is still extremely high in many countries. And actually, because women were in a better health status, some women actually had more children than they had before. So this declining child mortality together with very high fertility resulted in this tremendous population growth. Now let's have a focus on Europe. And it's also, I think we can nicely illustrate how this probabilistic, this stochastic population projection show how different age groups and the size of different age groups in the future is uncertain to different degrees. So this is a stochastic forecast of the population for the European Union in 2050. This is just the age pyramid. Most of you know women on the right, men on the left, ordered by age. And here also we listed the birth cohort in which year they were born. Interestingly, the, the, the lowest uncertainty uh, in 2050 is for the number of people that are 50 to 60 year old. So they're already born. We know how big their cohort size is. They have not yet entered the main uncertainty about old age mortality that we're going to talk about. They've already uh, sort of uh, passed the main peak age of migration, which is uh, around 20 to 25. And then here at the bottom, of course, this, the big uncertainty is the uncertainty about the future birth rate. And this sort of multiplies itself because it's already the uncertainty then about grandchildren, not only how many children will be, but children, children. Let me come uh, to this, what is surprising to quite some people, that one, uh, the number of very old people is highly uncertain. Like if you want to project how many 85-year or 90-year-old women there are going to be in Europe, there is sort of by a factor of three or four the uncertainty range. And this is just reflecting one of the hottest scientific debates uh, that I've recently experienced. It's about people who are saying that uh, we are close to a maximum life expectancy due to unhealthy lifestyle, obesity, uh, environmental pollution. And so we will not see much further increase in life expectancy. They are called the pessimists. And then the other school of thinking is the, the optimists that they say, well, if there even is a limit to the human life at all, it's likely to be beyond 115 or 120 years. So we have a long way to go. And we haven't yet seen the beginning of uh, genetic engineering influencing our uh, life expectancy. So there is just much more progress to come. There's even some extreme people, the philosopher at Cambridge saying that some of these people in the audience will be immortal. You will never die. Because if you survive the next 30 years, there will be all kinds of technologies in place to get you substitute organs to survive another 100 years, and then anything is possible. <laughs> Well, this, these are the groups, and we are just as demographers trying to reflect this. Um, there's another uh, inconvenient uh, certainty uh, about uh, the aging of the population. You see, this is uh, what we call the demographic support ratio. It's the, the number of people in working age divided by those at uh, pension age. You see, in uh, Europe at the moment, we have about four working age people per person above age 65. And with near certainty, this is going to decline uh, to about two. And actually, this becomes very important for, for fiscal and other uh, public policy considerations. So this very graph has been discussed uh, several times in the, the meeting of European Union ministers of uh, finance and economics, because it really poses some of the challenges. And uh, EU Commission President Barroso has repeatedly called the demographic challenge as one of the three main challenges facing Europe. But of course, this is, looks only so dramatic uh, if we keep these strict age limits. If we are more flexible in uh, also reflecting the fact that, let's say, the 60 is the new 50, or that people uh, are healthy for longer in a good stage and more active, then this picture, of course, looks different. We talk about this a little later on. Um, I've talked about the optimists and the pessimists. This comes particularly relevant when we look about the proportion of the population above the age of 80. At the moment, they are just 3 4% of the European population. But now, look at this. If the pessimists are right, then we are not going to see much further increase in life expectancy. We are going to be somewhere here at the bottom, maybe increase uh, to, to 7 or 10%. But if the optimists are right, we're going to see a slow but fundamental increase. And we'll end up in a society where about one third of the entire population will be above the age of 80. Uh, some people wonder whether this is uh, an optimistic scenario. <laughs> <laughs> and well, we can talk about what kind. It clearly will be a different kind of society. I just mentioned that the most prominent projections are the, the UN projections are always used. 
Unfortunately, the UN does not consider in their projections these mortality uncertainties. They only have a fertility uncertainty, and therefore their range of a future proportion of elderly is very much narrow because they're simply not reflecting this uh, old age mortality uncertainty. Now let's jump um, to uh, education, and uh, this will be most of the rest of the talk is going to be focusing on, on education and introducing education into demographic analysis, somehow capturing human capital. Throughout human history, and although very pronounced in this, today's developing countries, more educated women have lower mortality of their children and also have lower mortality themselves. Almost universally more educated people live longer. Oops, and uh, this is uh, really like just in several countries, Ethiopia, you see like 200 out of 1,000 babies dying for if the woman has no education, never been to school, 150 if at least some primary and uh, less than 10% if they have secondary or higher uh, education. And this is consistently, there in some countries uh, there's worrisome development, like Nigeria, there are some indications that things have actually gone worse recently. But again, this is mostly a, a trend for the uneducated uh, mothers and, of course, fathers. There's a high correlation between the education and men of husbands and wives. And for the more educated, the picture looks much less dramatic. Now, uh, most economists, when I talk, they say, well, actually, this is income. It's not education that we want to measure. So we recently did an extensive multi-level study trying to disentangle the effect of household wealth, which can be quite well measured in this demographic and health service for most developing countries, and uh, mother's education. And we have a big multivariate, multi-level model. But I, here, just first, I think it's more intuitive to show you splitting the sample into, like, along the median, the low-educated half and the higher-educated half the poor half and the richer half of the sample. And of course, there is a strong correlation. So you see uh, more women here in the low education poor group as well as in the high education rich group. But there are, the off diagonal is also a significant numbers of people. And the interesting fact is that, as expected, child mortality is by far the highest in this corner and by far the lowest here. But universally, in all the countries, in more than 25 countries, we looked, the high educated but poor women are doing significantly better. They have lower infant mortality than the rich but low educated women. Well, they are not really rich. They are just in the upper half of, of the wealth income. And this is in India, very clear. Uh, Indonesia, this is a huge sample. We have uh, tens of thousands of, of cases here. Again, uh, quite pronounced that uh, the educated poor women have less than 20, less uh, child mortality, infant mortality, uh, really pretty low. And the Richer but uneducated women have almost 30. Same in Malawi, the Africa, everything is at a much higher level, higher uh, infant mortality level, but the differentials go in the same direction. Now let's go to fertility. This is clearly the factor that is the driving force for future world population growth. And again, similar to infant mortality, throughout not just the developing world, throughout most countries in the world, we see that more educated women have clearly lower fertility than more highly educated women. We don't have the time to go into all the, the reasons. There are good causal models explaining this, both in terms of desired family size being typically lower for the more educated, where uh, the way Gary Becker put it too is that the, the women have this quantity quality trade off. They have, uh, uh, when they are more empowered, when they're more educated or, or higher income, then they, they want fewer children but afford a better life for those children. And uh, the second, of course, which has been very much proven is access to, to family planning. Also, the more educated women clearly find better ways to actually achieve the desired family size. They get better access to family planning and contraception. Just look at Ethiopia here, 2005 data. The red bar gives more than six children for women who've never been to school, who have no education, which is still a very high group in, in rural Ethiopia. And if they have at least junior secondary education, this is measured here going to school until the age of 15, they only have two on average. This is a, a huge differential, and we see this differential everywhere. Again, in some African countries, there has been concern about a stalled fertility decline. Look at Kenya over the last years. Uh, it had declined since the 1980s, and then there was not much of a decline. We see that this stall in the fertility decline is essentially something that is relevant for the least educated group. For the better educated one, fertility continued to decline. Okay, just this is a brief look uh, to fertility. 
Now let's uh, go back more systematically. Why should economists be interested? Or how should we interpret this data? Uh, often when we talk about particularly population aging or also the world population growth, people are seen as a liability. How many mouths to feed? Uh, how many uh, AIDS cases to cure? How many elderly to support? Uh, how will Europe manage to, to give the, the old uh, care, both the pensions as well as the health system? So it's, it's a liability. But at the same time, we see people are, as the only asset we have. It's the people that produce economic growth. And so any study of, of economic growth and prosperity must start with the people who produce it, either with their own hands, as used to be the case in, in traditional society, or through designing, building, or operating machines or institutions that make this economic growth possible. And now, this is where demographers also already start to be different than many economists. We don't treat people as a homogeneous group. People do not come as an amorphous mass. Not every member of a given population makes the same contribution to the economy. People differ most prominently, and as we have in our models, by age and sex. That's the traditional differentiation of demography. And now, this is something that my colleagues and I have, over the past years, uh, pushed very hard, and which is sort of being mainstreamed now, introducing educational attainment as a third demographic dimension in any standard demographic analysis. But then, of course, there's health status, labor force participation, uh, the whole, we just heard that the labor market participation, of course, makes a big difference whether this person is contributing uh, to, to national economic growth or not. So uh, let's focus a bit like how we define human capital. And this is pretty standard. Which, first of all, you need the number of people. They're the carriers of the human capital. And then it's their education and their skills and their different ways of measuring. And we'll discuss this. And of course, health is also important. If you're not in good health, you are uh, not able to contribute much. So with respect to the education, uh, typically the differentiation is between formal education and informal. Uh, we now only focus on the formal because that's easier to measure and also only on the quantity. I should mention, because it, it, and there are some papers by Hanushek and others that really show that for countries where we do have the data that the quality dimension is indeed very important. But unfortunately, for a global level analysis, we don't have the test data to really say much about the quality. And then, of course, the content becomes highly important at a higher education. Are you sort of teaching people in engineering or philosophy or whatever? For basic empowerment, for basic literacy, this is pretty standard there. Content is not so relevant. Now, another important distinction is like 99% of people who say they deal with education, they're dealing with the education flows. That's the policy available. That's measured in gross and net enrollment by age. It's kids in school and what do you do with these kids. But in, if we talk about human capital, what we're interested in is the education stock. And there it's important to see that the stock changes very slowly. It has a great momentum because the flow only comes at the young ages and then people move up the age pyramid, as I will soon show you. How do we measure the stock? Well, the economists most frequently just took the mean years of schooling of the adult population, either above age 15 or above age 25, which has many disadvantages, as I will tell you, because it really summarizes a very heterogeneous population. Um, we can look at the distribution by highest educational attainment. That's what we're going to do. It uh, has the advantage of really being able to look at the distributional aspects. Uh, and then uh, increasingly, there is some sort of quality testing in terms of functional literacy. Uh, there are attempts by UNESCO to have a survey, a global literacy assessment. But as I said before, the, we are still far away from satisfactory data there. Now, let's look at this is sort of one of my uh, favorite um, Pyramids, so we have the same age pyramid, women to the right, men to the left, all sorted by age, but now color gives you the third dimension, which is the highest educational attainment. And this is the Republic of Korea in the year 2000. And look, uh, Korea, and let's start with women. They are among the best educated. More than a third of young Korean women have completed tertiary education. They are doing well, very highly educated. But look at their mothers. Those women above the age of 60 or 65, more than half of them have never been to school. How can this be in one of the richest and most prosperous and well-educated societies? Well, for demographic reasons, it's very simple. When these women were at school age in the 1950s, Korea was a desperately poor developing country without a developed school system. Now, this is uh, the basis, and this is a nice illustration for this huge momentum in population growth. 
Now let's, instead of giving you big form matrices with notation that will be unknown to you, I try to just have this simple chart. What is the basic idea of population dynamics? Here looking at population projections. We have an age pyramid in 2000 of any country, and now we want to produce the age pyramid in 2005. Well, everybody is going to be five years older. So one thing we do is we just shift this pyramid five years up, one step up. And then uh, over the years, of course, people will be dying, and we have age-specific mortality rates for men and women. They tend to differ. Uh, forget the color for the time being. And, and then we have migration, some people coming into the country and leaving the country during this. And then once we have sort of the pyramid above the age of five projected, we still need to fill the lowest age group. That is the babies born in between. So we as apply a set of age-specific fertility rates to the women uh, here in that age group, and then we have uh, infant mortality rates here, so that together will result in the estimate of how many babies, children will be in the age group zero to four uh, five years later. So that's the basic principle. I think that's intuitively quite clear. Now, if we subdivide the population, and this is the method that's called multi-state demography, then we simply multiply the, the number of schedules. So, uh, we have women here of, let's say, four different educational levels, and they have four different fertility status uh, rates. Uh, also, mortality will differ by uh, level of education, and so will migration. So essentially, we, we sort of multiply. This method originally has come out of geography, where we wanted to do projections of a country, the different provinces that interact with each other. But uh, this state uh, definition can be used to anything, marital status and in this case, for education, it's, it's quite appropriate. Well, um, we at YASA had recently done a big reconstruction of human capital for all countries in the world using these uh, demographic uh, methods, which um, we claim is, is better than many of the other reconstructions that are out there by Barrow and Lee and, and, and others, uh, because we, we do sort of have it in five-year age groups for the full distribution, not just the mean years of schooling, and also considering these uh, differentials by, by level of education in terms of mortality and fertility. There were some assumptions, and if you're interested, I can give you the citations. These papers have all uh, been published. Um, now, let's, this again is uh, Korea 2000. Now, let's just show how this works in going down in steps. So, what we're doing now, this is 95, 1990, we're sort of moving down the pyramid. If we're projecting, we're moving it up. If we're reconstructing, we're moving it down. 1985, 80, 75, 1970. So this was Korea in 1970. You see, at that point, really, the female adult population was essentially uneducated and only for the youngest age groups. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the ed education efforts have started. You can't do this indefinitely. We stopped in 1970 because if you go further back, uh, the assumptions about what happens in the highest age groups uh, become too strong because in, in the starting year, you only have, let's say, 80 and plus as the upper open interval. And if you then move to back 30 years, that's going to be 50 plus. Okay, because it's a nice, let's just move back again, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90. So this really explains how the... Uh, how societies change from the bottom. And we've developed other models, not for education, any sort of if some political opinions are formed. Or we recently had a paper published in Science Magazine on European identity and demography, where we show that identity is formed at young ages, and then it also is relatively constant along chord lines. And we can also project such soft issues such as identity in terms of demographic multi-state models. Okay, now we can, of course, do projections. This would be uh, Korea in 2030. You see fertility is extremely low in Korea. It's only 1.2 children per woman, and it's, it's going to be a rapidly aging society. And here the key question for Korea, as well as it will be for many European countries, is whether the higher education of the young people will be able to compensate or possibly even overcompensate, as some people claim, for the smaller number of young people. So we recently had a conference on optimal fertility in Vienna where we exactly discussed these issues. Is it really optimal to have replacement level fertility to surviving children, which would reside sort of in a stable population age structure? It may not be. Some models show it's more 1.6 or 1.7, meaning moderate shrinking if it is accompanied with better in investment in human capital. How much time do I have left? Another five minutes, okay. Good, now let's, uh, like this is China. 
China has been phenomenal uh, increase in human capital. You need the China population from 1970 to 2050. Again, colors give you the uh, education, and you see the labor force of China has been increasing until now and will soon start to decline. But I'm not so worried that many people are about aging China. Look at the educational composition. There used to be very low education. The red ones are completely disappeared. More than a, a sort of 60, 80 percent of the Chinese population at working age will have secondary or tertiary education. India was quite different. India invested in elitist education while leaving half of the population behind. Uh, in illiteracy, this red area. And even so, now the Indian government is making great efforts to improve schooling in the rural areas. It will take long to reduce the illiteracy at the adult population level because of this before mentioned, very high inertia. So for that reason, partly the Indian labor force will not stop growing by the middle of the century. But this is a relatively optimistic scenario following the Indian policies. There can also be a pessimistic scenario that we call the constant enrollment numbers. If India stops building new schools, actually the number of uneducated will increase over time because population is still growing and uh, uh, enrollment rates will decline as a function of no schools being built, and, and that becomes a much worse picture. Now, Science Magazine is now having a big uh, special issue on population, and actually just last night I got the green light for a, uh, acceptance of a paper that is a big review of global human capital, where they ask us to do different scenarios of how different education policies would translate into different paths of world population growth just simply by assuming identical education-specific fertility rates. So the fertility rates are identical, and we just have different education policies. And just look at the, the different, most extreme. This is the constant education enrollment scenarios where the world population would indeed increase up to 10 billion by the middle of the century already and have many more uneducated people here. Then this is the fast track scenario, which has the the fastest possible, like everybody following Korea or Singapore, which would, even by the middle of the century, already have less than a billion people less. So this really implies that education may be by far the most effective policy in, in stabilizing population growth. Well, time is running out. Um, let me just uh, have a comparison of the mega regions here. You see Europe and North America already now, unfortunately something went wrong with the labels here, has more people of working age with then, uh, sorry, China region has many more, and South Asia, many more people in absolute numbers of working age than Europe and North America taken together. But the reason why Europe and North America are still dominating the world is the high proportion of blue color here. It's the tertiary educated and the secondary educated. But China is catching up already in 2015. China will have the same absolute number of people with uh, secondary or tertiary education as Europe and North America together. So India, South Asia will take much longer. So this is really, I believe, some of the basic underlying forces uh, by the, the change we see in, in global power, global economic power, but also global political power. And here, just a hint, if you're interested in science, we published a paper where we finally could do the sort of statistical proof using this new uh, five-year education data that indeed uh, Human capital is a key driver of economic development. And what we find here is uh, that really it is uh, not the investment in tertiary education that many people thought is the key, nor universal primary education alone that helps to bring countries out of poverty. But it is the combination of uh, universal primary education with widespread secondary education. So it's really the, the junior secondary that needs to be added also to the millennium development goal of universal primary education. Now, just since time is running out, we had another paper uh, that uh, tries to apply these new data sets to different other returns to education. And here, that we just uh, uh, published on demography, education, and democracy, taking the Freedom House uh, indicator of democratic rights. And we had a specific look at Iran. Iran is so interesting. It had the world history's most rapid decline in fertility, despite of the Mullah regime. In 85, the fertility was still about seven children per woman in Iran and today it is below replacement level. This was through massive investment in rural villages in female education and family planning services under one of the most pronounced Islamic regimes. Very interesting story. 
And based on this and the very strong relationship we find uh, between education and democracy, we dare the prediction that with a high probability, Iran is moving into the direction of a modern democracy. Of course, we can't say the point in time, but there's a very strong uh, push in that direction. I should also say many people talk about the causality issues. I didn't have time. These um, age structure dynamics gives us a very good analytical handling to uh, see like what happens first. The investment in basic education particularly needs to come many years, yeah, two or three decades before we can expect the benefits through a better educated adult population. So this is a neat analytical handle to, to sort of solve this endogeneity issue. Well, we think it's so important that for the Wittgenstein Center opening uh, symposium here in the historical room of the Austro-Hungarian Parliament, we have demography, education, and democracy as our topic. So if you are around Vienna on the 29th of September, you're welcome here. This is neat insofar because this is probably the world's first parliament which was multinational. They used to speak five, six languages there without simultaneous translation. They were just shouting and hoping that they would understand each other. <laughs> Yeah, another big project that was mentioned is my ERC advanced grant really uh, now is assessing empirical evidence on the uh, relationship between enhanced education and uh, adaptive capacity to climate change. And this is uh, just uh, some a very evident relationship that death to disasters decline uh, at a given strength of disaster if the population is better educated, even when controlling uh, for income. Well, we have to come to the end and um, I put a hypothesis summarizing parts of these things in the philosophical transactions, which again, sort of in the biological sciences. And since this is the world's oldest scientific journal, where initially they wrote in, in Latin, so I gave it also a Latin title, Sola Scola et Sanitate, only through schooling and, and basic health. So human capital as the root cause and priority for international development, where I also give through some of the uh, systems analytical evidence that we did over the last 20 years at Yasa, really trying to view all things together and see sort of which adjustment screw is the one that has the longest and biggest impacts of all the possible adjustment. It, again and again, it turns out to be a basic female education. And just now the world as a positive outlook, this was the world pyramid put all together, all countries of the world in 1970. At that time, we were three and a half billion people Lots of them uneducated, so you see a lot of red area. Here we are today, this is our world, about twice the size, seven billion people. We see that there still is the so-called bottom billion, as Paul Collier calls it, but most of the addition to the world population has been those with secondary and tertiary education. And this is the projection to 2050. Still a bigger world population of, of roughly eight and a half to nine billion, and again, uh, much of the addition is likely to be better educated while we still will have some pockets of, of poverty and uneducation. And if you want to look, see this in terms of the world map, this is the world map of 1970. And the variable here is the, the proportion of women 20 to 39, because to us this really turned out to be the key age group of women who have at least <coughs> junior secondary education. And this is the familiar picture we have in our minds, the world divided between the well-educated rich north and the poorly educated south. Today, the world has already changed. You see, uh, Latin America has turned green, large parts of Asia have turned green, and this pocket of um, low education remains largely in Africa. And if these trends continue in 2050, the world will be a lot more green. And this is a, a reason for optimism, despite of all the signals of pessimism we have in these days. Thank you very much.